Ed, I'm sorry, Wolfgang, she said, her voice soft and as lovely as her violin. I don't do you justice anymore. She turned from the music stand and went to the bed. She closed the violin in its case and sat down on the bed, its springs creaking. Burying her face in her hands, she began crying, her shoulders shaking. Vincent wanted to go to her. He wanted to put his arms around her and comfort her, but he was unable to move. He begged his legs to function, but they refused. The phone rang downstairs, and he involuntarily turned toward the sound. Silently cursing the distraction, he looked back into the third floor room, but Catherine Malloy was gone. So that's his first sighting of her. And then, uh, then he goes back into his funk. He's uh, not really painting. And uh, so he had a crisis when he was forty. Did you have a crisis when you turned thirty last year? <laughs> Does it come from personal experience? <laughs> 30's actually fun. <laughs> it was. Yeah, yeah. 30 was fun. Um, here's here's uh, uh, where he, he gets a little bit more into it here. He, okay, so for the third day in a row, Vincent stared at the empty canvas. Nothing came. He threw his paintbrush and palette on the dresser and said, shit. How could this be happening? I've knocked off three really good paintings in record time. I've reopened the well. And how the hell could it have dried up already? He strode to the window and yanked it open. Cold air hit him and he leaned into it, sucking it in, letting it fill his lungs. It coursed through him, calming him. And as it calmed him, he realized the reason for his dried up well. Closing his eyes, he bowed his head, and for the first time in years, Vincent Vermeer consciously prayed, God, he said, clutching the windowsill, his knuckles white. white. She didn't call. She said she would call, and she didn't call. Of course, he's talking about his wife. Mm -hmm. The sweet sound of Catherine Malloy's violin immediately reached his ears. His eyes flew open. He didn't know what Catherine was playing but it was both melodious and mournful. He stepped back from the window and turned towards the door. The music drew him and he let it carry him from his studio down the hall and up the stairs to the third floor. He reached for the doorknob but stopped in mid-reach. The handle was different. It was made of multifaceted crystal. Above it were three thick wrought iron slide locks. He slid each lock open then turned the crystal doorknob. He pushed the door open and stepped inside. Catherine Malloy played her violin in front of the bedroom's only window. She wore a powder blue dress, its collar round and lacy. From beneath this long flowing skirt, he saw bare feet. Her hair, the same color and curly like Kate's, was pulled up on top of her head, ringlets falling down around her face. She played with her eyes closed and her body swayed as she played. Her gently angled face, free of makeup, was beautiful and so much like Kate's that it startled him. He didn't disturb her, but listened as she played. She was in the music. She was the music. As she slid the bow across the strings, body swaying. He watched her amazed, knowing that were she on stage, the entire audience would be as mesmerized as he. The piece ended abruptly with a final short burst of notes. Eyes still closed, she lowered the violin, a small smile crossing her face. She bowed her head and softly said, Amen. Raising her head, she turned towards the door and opened her eyes. She gasped and hugged the violin to her breast. Why, sir! Her voice was lovely, holding a slight Irish accent, its tone sweet to the ears. Pardon me, Mrs. Malloy, Vincent said, bowing. How do you know my name? I? He didn't know what to tell her. In fact, he couldn't believe he was standing in the Victorian's third floor bedroom talking with Kate's grandmother. Are you an acquaintance of Jethro's? Sort of. 
His heart pounded in his chest. He clasped his hands behind his back so that she would not see him shaking. He is most likely at church. She went to the bed and laid the violin in its case. Although I don't know for sure, he did not come up to see me this morning. Vincent remained silent. She closed the violin case. Looking up at Vincent, she said, Do you have a name, sir? Vincent. Vincent Vermeer. I like the name Vincent, she said. Like Vincent van Gogh. I love his paintings. Are you one of Jethro's workers? No. Then why are you here? She hugged herself. You shouldn't have come up here. Jethro would not like it. Why is that? She opened her mouth to speak, but did not. Shaking her head, she said, I have told you too much already. You, a complete stranger in my room. Vincent glanced, glanced about the room. It was not the flowery room he'd seen the first night he'd gone to the third floor. Nor was it the room he'd seen in his earlier dream of her. This room was stark. The bed was wrought iron with a simple white bedspread. A pine armoire stood on the wall beside the door. A dresser to the window's left held a porcelain bowl and pitcher. A chamber pot sat beside the bed. A single yellow light bulb hung from the ceiling. There were no curtains on the window, only a yellowed window shade. The hardwood floor was scuffed and uncovered by carpets. You must leave, she said. I don't want to leave. You must. Why did you come up here? I heard you playing. I wanted to meet a person who could make a simple violin sound so lovely. She smiled in spite of her anxiety. Thank you. He gestured at the violin. I have not heard anyone play as well or as beautifully as you, Mrs. Malloy. I hope you share your gift with the world. She averted her eyes. I used to. And now? And now I am Mrs. Jethro Malloy. I play for my husband. Does he ever listen? Sadness filled her eyes. You are too forward, Mr. Vermeer. I apologize. Please, you must go. If Jethro comes home and finds you here. She shuddered. I don't care what Jethro thinks. I want to get to know how his talented and gifted wife. She turned away. There is no need to get to know her. He stared at her back. She was thin. In fact, he thought her too thin. Please don't dismiss me. She didn't respond. I may be forward, but I think you're beautiful. She turned back to him with tears on her cheeks. He fought the impulse to go to her, take her in his arms and comfort her. Instead, holding his place, he smiled and said, Come now, don't cry. Sniffing, she wiped at her tears with her hand and managed to smile. Ah, that's better. Her smile widening, she said, You are not like any man I have ever known, Mr. Vernet. Why is that? Why, you are forward and brash, she pointed at him. And the way you are dressed on a Sunday, why, it's at the very least unconventional. He looked down at himself. He wore paint-splattered jeans, loafers, and his Williamsburg shirt. He touched his whiskered chin. He hadn't shaved since Thursday. Lord knew what his hair looked like. He couldn't remember whether or not he had combed it after breakfast. He, had, he ran a hand through it. Catherine chuckled. You need a thorough scrubbing, as my mother used to say. I suppose I do. And yet you say you are not a workman. You say you sort of know Jethro, but you don't say how. You are quite the mystery. Do you like mysteries, Mrs. Malloy? He stepped further into the room. She took a step back, keeping the bed between them. I have read a few. For you to be so bold, so unafraid of Jethro, I must ask, did my husband send you? I am a painter, Vincent said, a portrait painter. I have come to paint your portrait. The words spilled out of him without prior thought. He had intended to tell her he was a painter and leave it at that. But the words had taken on their own life, and after he had said them, Vincent discovered he was grinning. Yes, he thought, he would paint Catherine Malloy's portrait. His well had not run dry after all. But you have brought no paints or easel. One does not just jump into a portrait, Mrs. Malloy. One must first get to know his subject. Ironic, she said wistfully. My husband will not include me in his life, and yet he wants my portrait painted. 
Your husband has not hired me. She frowned, tiny lines just like Kate's appearing between her eyebrows. Then why do you want to paint my portrait if you are to be paid no money? Because I must, Mrs. Malloy. Yes, I must. I must paint the woman who plays such beautiful music on her violin. What will you do with this portrait when it is finished? I will prominently display it for all the world to see. Jethro will never allow that, Mr. Vermeer. Jethro can go to hell, Mrs. Malloy. She stared at him, shock in her green eyes. Please let me paint you. I certainly you can't mean, she broke off and turned into the window. He's home. You must go, quickly. Vincent ran to the window and stood beside her, their arms touching. He could feel the panic within her. He looked down the driveway. Instead of concrete, he saw bricks. The 1924 Ford, the very one Vincent had seen in the carriage house, pulled into the driveway, a man in a derby bowler at the wheel. Catherine grabbed Vincent's arm. Hurry, you must go. Please, don't let him find you here. You don't know his temper. Please, I beg you. Vincent looked down at Catherine's hands, tugging on his muscled upper arm. In spite of her frailty, her grip was strong, insistent. He laid his hand over top of hers and with a reassuring smile said, I'll go. It's going to be all right. She released her, his arm and he ran for the door. Turning back, he said, may I come back? May I paint you? Yes, I'll wait for you. He dashed out the door and pulled it close. He slid the slide locks over and ran down the stairs. He stopped at the bottom, wondering which way to go. Jethro was going up the driveway to the carriage house. Surely he would enter via the back door. Vincent sprinted down the stairs to the front foyer and hurried out the front door. He stopped on the front porch, blinking. His rodeo sat in the driveway. What, he said, staring in disbelief at the rodeo. He went back inside. His leather jacket and tweed cap hung on the coat rack. He ran up the stairs and down the hall. He took the third floor stairs two at a time. He stared in wonder at the door. The crystal knob was gone as were the slide locks. He grabbed the brass knob and opened the door. The flowery, cheerful room with the violin case on the bed greeted him. <laughs> Vincent went to the window and stared down at the concrete driveway. He turned from the window and leaned his rear on the sill. What in God's name just happened to me? Did I really go back in time and talk with Catherine Malloy, or did I imagine the whole thing? So my takeaway from that is that to get women, I need to be more direct. <laughs> And know how to travel through time. <laughs> there you go. You got it. <laughs>